Well, welcome everyone to our webinar session this afternoon. Uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, we are very excited to have uh, this topic presented for our National Native HIV Network this month on trauma-informed case management. So this is just our webinar outline. We will do some housekeeping, um, some introductions, an overview of the National Native HIV Network. Uh, and we will introduce our distinguished presenter. And we will have um, some discussions and questions and answers at the end. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Savannah. Hello, everyone. Um, so for today's session, it is being recorded. And this recording will be shared on our Facebook page and also our YouTube channel. Um, if you could introduce yourself in the chat with your name, tribal affiliation, if that's applicable, and also your agency. Um, we'd like to get to know you for the short time that we're together today. And then if you have any questions on the bottom part of your screen in the Zoom menu, you'll see um, the Q&A section please submit your questions there um, so that way we can keep track of them and ask them at the end of today's session or when appropriate during the session. And also we'll be sharing the evaluation link in the chat at the end of the session. So please um, provide us with your feedback. It's valuable to us in the planning for our webinars and also to improve um, the work that we're doing within the communities. So thank you for joining us. Great, thank you, Savannah, for that. Uh, well, I just want to go ahead and formally introduce myself. Yat a she ya Elton Nazo in Shia, Tohan in Shita Tabaha Bashishin, Nakaidena Eda Shachay Tetnas at the Eda Shinawe, Dia Yadena Inchle. Hello, my name is Elton Noswood. I am the co-coordinator for the National Native HIV Network. I'm a member of the Navajo Nation and I'm currently in chilly Denver, Colorado. No, no more snow, but it is chilly. So glad to be here. And <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Savannah Jean and I'm the program director for the Community Health Education and Resiliency Program at the Albuquerque Area Indian Health Board. I'm also an administrator for the National Native HIV Network. Um, I'm originally from Burnt Corn, Arizona, but have worked and lived in Albuquerque for the last, since 2003. So um, I've been working with the health board for going on 12 years now. So thank you again. Um, for being with us. Great, and thank you, Savannah, uh, my dear relative, uh, for being with us. So we will be your moderators for today's session. And, um, and, and just an overview of the National Native HIV Network. Um, it's an organization, um, it's, it's an indigenous led initiative uh, that mobilizes our native communities affected by HIV through peer to peer uh, program peer-to-peer -peer and programmatic support. We also do training and capacity building assistance. Um, we do have uh, representatives from throughout the country as well as um, Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, and so this is just a map on how our, our, our network is regionally uh, represented. And so uh, we just wanna be able to thank those who are, know the network or who are part of the network for being a part of this um, webinar as well. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our esteemed uh, presenter today. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Marilyn Zimmerman is Nakota Dakota Ojibwe Nawi and, and is the co-principal investigator and senior director of policy and programs at the National Native Children's Trauma Center. Dr. Zimmerman is the former tribal senior policy advisor at OJJDP and founding director of the NNCTC. She has been a member of numerous national, state, and local committees and work groups, including the United States Presidential Commission to Eliminate Child Abuse and Neglect Fatalities under President Barack Obama and the Advisory Committee 
of the Attorney General's National Task Force on American Indian and Alaska Native Children's Exposed to Violence under Attorney General Eric Holder. Dr. Zimmerman has expertise in trauma-informed systems change, provides training and technical assistance in all service systems serving American Indian and Alaska Native children and families, and has participated in cultural adaptations of evidence-based and best practices. Finally, Dr. Zimmerlin understands the relationship and community-based principles for the development of trauma-informed best practices for tribes and our relatives. So I want to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Zimmerman, who I've known for many years and have um, esteem, uh, respect for, and very happy that she is with us today to present to our network. Uh, Dr. Zimmerman. Thank you, Alton. Next slide, please. All right, so the topic today is trauma-informed approaches to case management, and you're going to find out that um, trauma-informed approaches and practices are pretty universal. That's what we focus on is the universal strategies for tribal communities. Um, very often because those targeted or selected, uh, if you're thinking public health uh, chart, um, there's very few master's level, PhD level of uh, folks that are working in rural reservation communities. Um, but also there seems to be uh, quite a challenge to get to services in urban settings also. So we're gonna think, be thinking about very broadly about what it means to be trauma-informed um, in uh, the practice of case management. Next slide, please. So first, before I start rolling this out, I wanna say that I love to be interrupted. So as Elton ha has already said, please, if you have a comment, uh, a story, a question, please in the chat, um, Elton's going to monitor the chat for me and he will uh, either save the questions for the end or if it seems appropriate, uh, the statements or whatever comments you're making are appropriate for the time, then uh, he'll interrupt me and I'm very comfortable with that. So just wanna say that. So why do we need to talk about trauma? So it, as we look about it, we, we do know if you all have heard of the ACEs study that um, we have come to the conclusion that many of the pressing health issues that are um, contributing to the poor health of Americans in general, but in particular American Indian uh, people, families and communities, um, it really has a, a link to exposure to traumatic events, either early in life or early in life and, it's, and seems to be ongoing. And in particular, um, we know that those people who are uh, engaging in high risk behaviors are doing that just because, or not just because, they're doing that very often as it's their coping strategy, right? So they're trying to get over the, um, the feelings of lack of safety or meaning or whatever, it, and they're using substances or uh, illicit sex or whatever it is that they're doing to try to help themselves feel better. So anyway, it is our most pressing health issue. We know it's preventable. Um, it, there's, no, um, there's no reason that we have to live in a world where we can't make a difference in people who have experienced traumatic events. Um, life we have, I mean, being a human being means that we're exposed to all kinds of traumatic events in our lifetime, potentially. Um, none of us walks through this, this life without something, right? A loss of some kind, the loss of a relative or the loss of a job or the loss of our independence, whatever that can look like. So it's really about the exposure to those traumatic events like violence, can be violence, or these traumatic losses that we can experience. Um, we know that we can heal from the impact of trauma. And there are some evidence-based trauma treatment models that are out there that you can become trained in. Um, but we also know that uh, we can support our relatives in our households, in our own little communities to help us heal from trauma. And that's building, at that the anecdote is building our resilience. Um, making different meaning out of what's happened to us. And what leads us to the next point is it, it asks the right question. Um, I know my grandma and my grandma's generation, she raised me. She would always say to some of our relatives and shake her finger, what's the matter with you? Sober up, get your kids back. 
What's wrong with you? Treat that woman right. Get your family back together. Well, we now know that it is that that, that isn't the correct question. Very often, some of the some of the behaviors that we um, we engage in ourselves or some of our relatives engage in aren't helpful to their health or well being. But but it is probably a direct response to trauma. And so we now have learned to ask the right question instead of what's wrong with you, what's happened to you? And just a little for, little more in, tem, in depth, not just what's happened to you, but what's happened to you and what meaning do you make of it? Um, what, how do you uh, remember that, that event in your life? And so that, that's what we really want to talk about. It asks the right questions so that we can begin to think in those terms of what's happened to this individual that they're manifesting these behaviors in front of us that aren't about us, but they're happening around us and in front of us. Next slide, please. So first we got to sort of define what a traumatic event is. So um, this is from SAMHSA's definition of trauma and it's individual trauma results from an event or a series of events or a set of circumstances. So it can be a one-time car wreck, uh, it can be a range fire, a flood, or it can be a series of events, a child that's experiencing ongoing neglect you know, through, throughout their childhood or a set of circumstances. Uh, poverty is a is a circumstance that we find ourselves in in our tribal communities, and it's not a crime or a sin to be poor. But in particular, as we think about the next generations of our of our relatives, what is so impactful about poverty is not just that it depletes the financial resources of a caregiver, but it also can is so burdensome that it deplete can deplete their spiritual resources, their uh, physical resources, their psychological and emotional resources. So it's really a set of circumstances that are experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse impacts on that individual's functioning, the mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So again, it's the event and how it's perceived by an individual. So none of us can say to another person, to one of our relatives, oh gosh, you know what? I experienced childhood sexual abuse and I got over it, so you will too. Or I was in a really bad car wreck and I'm over it, you will, you're gonna get over it. Or why are you still acting like that? Why are you still so afraid? You should be over that stuff by now. None of us get to say that because we all have our own individual responses to the events that occur in our life in our lives. Next slide, please. Now, here's the ACEs study, the adverse childhood experiences. And it really did look at uh, uh, the questions from zero to 10, um, and you got an answer for one of uh, one every time you answered one of the questions. So if you answered, if the, one of the questions was, did you ever experience sexual abuse? And you, you maybe you experienced sexual abuse from three to five, and then maybe you were raped at 15, and then maybe you were raped at 25. It doesn't matter that that it happened this these different ways different times if it, you at all ever experienced it you got a one a score of one and so that was for the all of the 10 questions and they found out that for most america for in this particular study that people who had an a score of four or more um ha, were higher had higher risk behaviors like smoking overeating um iv drug use, uh, substance abuse, that sort of thing. And it obviously, uh, we can't come to a place in our lives where it really shortens our lifespan. We now know that people who have an ACE score of, uh, I believe it's six or more, um, have, are more likely to die 20 years before our peers. So thinking about all of the events that have happened in the life of an American Indian family or community, what the ACEs study didn't talk about was the social context or the local context and the struggles that we um, that we have faced in as American Indian people in North America, and it just it, it we didn't look at historical trauma. We didn't look at we don't look at our current social constructs, our accessibility to good education or health care, um, or uh, safe communities. So it did not 
or rate our experience of racism or, or sexism. So it did not measure those things. So we have to think about the layer, layering impact of all of the traumatic events an individual can experience in their life. Next slide, please. So there have been a few studies in Indian country about ACEs. Uh, this is the one I wanna talk about a little bit and we'll look at a couple more. So in this particular study, there was 1,660 uh, enrolled tribal members from seven different tribes that were given the ACE study questions. And uh, in the original ACE study, the 63% um, of those respondents who are mostly white, well-insured, um, living in San Diego, California, uh, individuals, 63% had experienced one ACE, at least one. Where in an American Indian sample, 86% of us have experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. Uh, for those that reported four or more ACEs in that general population, only 12.5 had, had actually had experienced four or more. Whereas the American Indian population, 33% of us have at, ACEs scores of four or more. So obviously we're being uh, exposed to higher rates of violence, to higher stressors uh, of uh, family um, disintegration, you know, lots, lots of um, lots of single moms and single dads and grandmas and grandpas and aunties and uncles raising kids and struggling in that way. So um, we all can see that, um, it were, it's having a bigger impact on us as Indian people. Um, next slide, please. Here's a few more. Um, I wanna draw your attention to a, the second study, uh, the 288 youth ages 14 to 24 in the Northern Plains Reservation. Um, we're given the child ACE, ACEs questions. And 78% of the, in this one community, 78% of those 14 to 24 at least had experienced at least one traumatic event. And then if we looked at uh, multiple or severe exposures, 40% um, had more than one and 37% reported between three and six exposures. So our children and our young adults are experiencing a lot of exposure. We have a colleague in Spokane, Washington, who did a Sentinel study um, using the ACEs question on Head Start children. Now, I, when I think of Spokane, Washington, a lot of my husband's relatives live there. When I think of Spokane, Washington, I think it, uh, it's very, very, uh, uh, how do I put this? Um, there are not many people of color in that city. It's mostly, it's very, it's the majority of our white people. So that's who the Head Start population represents also. So they did a Sentinel study, which means they asked the caregivers, um, and it didn't matter if it was mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, they asked the caregivers the, the ACEs questions on behalf of the children, those, those three and four-year-olds. And uh, they, it had to be things that they absolutely knew. So it couldn't be a mother who had you know, been divorced a couple of years who suspected her ex-husband of maybe sexually abusing the child. She had to actually either witness it or know it, or you had to know, you couldn't guess, you couldn't suspect, that sort of thing. And what was remarkable for three and four-year-olds in that, in that community, um, they were coming out with scores on three and four ACE scores. So it's prevalent, obviously traumatic events are prevalent in this country, in North America. Next slide, please. So again, really helping us understand that, that we do have those individual risk factors, right? Depending on the family we're born into, the kind of parenting uh, that we receive, um, the kinds of uh, care to, that we have, um, access to healthcare, as I said, those sorts of things. But we also have to pay attention to the risk of historical and intergenerational trauma, uh, structural issues like access to poor education, um, and often that are rooted in systemic violence against or devaluing de de us as Native people. So it ha it's cumulative and it's layered and we have to always remember that. So it's very interesting. Every time I think about frontline caregivers, like case managers, um, I think that 
what we can't just think about their, their personal history, right? We have to think about the history of their family, the history of their community, the history of their tribe, and the, what all of those experiences that all added up. And it's, it's, a, it's a lot, it's a heavy burden for some of us. Next slide, please. So just want to, again, I want to bring home because I think we forget. I, I, I know we forget. I have trained, there was one in particular incident where I had spent two or three days in a tribal community training the administrators and teaching staff of a public school that served that had 100% American Indian students. And we did, we did the whole exposure and, you know, and we went into the the impacts on their mental health, their development, right? Their cognitive and physical and emotional and psychological development um, and all of the impacts it had on educational outcomes. I mean, we went into some pretty big detail and I had an administrator say, oh gosh, those are our kids. Yep, this is so good. This is gonna be so good for our staff. It's gonna be wonderful. And then I literally was driving away because we drove to this particular uh, training. We were driving in a way and probably about 140 miles away from that city, I got a phone call saying that that same administrator had told me how helpful and wonderful and how it would change his practice had just uh, slammed a teenager boy up against the wall and, and leaned into him, got in his face and said, I hear you don't like it when people get in your face. So, we, I, that, this is why I spend a little, quite a bit of time. We have to remember that our relatives have these experiences and that's very often their, they, their way of, uh, their strategies for survival um, are really brilliant, but can be personally costly. Uh, for example, I once worked with, in a, uh, where I worked in my community and we had um, a child protection team meeting and a couple of sisters 15 and 17 came to the attention of child protection um, be because of truancy so they were missing a lot of school and uh you know what what was the issue and were they just naughty kids and i think that that was at that time the belief but um what we found out later was that they were living in a household where there was a sexual perpetrator and he, they in order to protect themselves, they would stay awake while he was awake. And that was really brilliant, right? So sometimes if he stayed up really late, one of them would sleep while the other one would stay up and then they would switch. Well, sometimes that meant that they didn't get to sleep until three or four in the morning, right? So when you're 15 and 17 and you're responsible for getting yourself off to school at you know, 7.30, eight o'clock in the morning and you don't go to bed till three or four in the morning, it's often you are, are not just truant, but you miss the whole day. Brilliant, creative strategies for survival, but personally costly because the 17-year-old was in danger of not graduating from high school and the 15-year-old was uh, in danger of not moving on to the next grade level. She had missed so much school. So just think about that and, and look at, these are not American Indians. These are average American women and men um, who have experienced serious mental illness or been addicted to substances, um, have suffered sexual abuse or uh, severe violence from at the hands of their caregivers, those people that are supposed to love and care for them. Um, and thinking about our juvenile detention settings or 90% uh, of uh, incarcerated girls who report sexual, physical, or severe emotional abuse. So it's pretty prevalent. Next slide, please. Here's something from the CDC that gets its, uh, its uh, data sets from the National Violence Statistics System, the National Violent Death Reporting System, and the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Surveys. So for American Indian people, homicide's the third leading cause of death for American Indian males between one and 44 years of age. Um, homicide is the sixth leading cause of death for females of the same age range um, to other serious crimes. I don't know why that's there. Um, so there's lots of interpersonal conflicts that are common and many of us uh, really link the history of boarding schools where our, our parents were, our children were removed from the nurturing, loving um, households and communities 
where they were were where the parents engaged in cultural ways of uh, of parenting, but it wasn't just the responsibility of the parents, it was the responsibility of the grandmas and the grandpas, the aunties and the uncles, the elders and the warriors all had a role in the well-being of that individual child. And when the boarding school era came along and they uh, abruptly removed those children, sometimes as young as three or four or five, and they didn't return home until they were, you know, 15, 17, 18, um, they experienced a lot of sexual abuse, a lot of physical abuse, deprivations of food and warmth, not just physical warmth, but emotional warmth. Um, so they came back um, engaging in behaviors that they were raised with. And uh, we really lost a lot to those gener generations of children lost to boarding schools. And that I believe is really critical to the conversation today about why we have so many interpersonal conflicts, why um, you know arguments end up in physical fights or intimate partner violence or you know homicides most often um, were precipitated by all of these sort of issues. And then a quarter of all of the homicides for American Indians were related to another serious crime. That's it. I didn't erase the last one. Um, so. It really is prevalent. Next slide, please. So again, let's taking a look, bringing it home, giving you all the really, really bad news. Um, there's an estimated 48% of American Indian women and men who have experienced contact sexual, sexual violence, physical violence, stalking. Um, sexual violence includes rape, being made to penetrate someone else sexual co coercion or unwanted sexual contact. Um, there are high rates of sexual violence during the lifetime and that an estimated 46% of us women and 23% of our men experience some form of contact sexual violence. 29 to 30% of us uh, have been raped, women, and 13% of men. And again, 41% of women and over 60% of men experience non-contact forms of violence. Uh, uh, sexual violence, such as someone exposing themselves to them or verbal uh, harassment on the streets or threats or that sort of thing. Next slide, please. So now we know exposure is huge, right? It's it, if any of us, I, I mean, when I used to do training on ACEs and I would, I can remember my doing it for my own tribal uh, leadership, my own tribal executive board. And when we, you know, we did a very small presentation and when we got done, I can remember a couple of my councilmen saying to me, gosh, I've got a seven. Like, what is that supposed to mean, right? Well, he was particularly resilient, obviously. Um, he found ways of, make, of, of healing, of building his resilience, uh, of, you know, caring about his family, but it did impact his life in some way, you know, with his poor health outcomes and maybe some challenging relationships during his lifetime. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's prevalent. So let's understand trauma in service settings as case managers. Uh, that's as you're that, if that's your role. Next slide, please. Always trying to make sure that we remember the intersectionality of human beings, right? We're not just one thing. I'm not just a woman. I'm a native woman. I'm a native woman living in an urban setting. I'm a native, native woman living in an urban setting who has been colonized because I have been raised and educated in the Western European way of being in the world. And so to decolonize my own way of being in the world has been challenging. <laughs> um, challenging and rewarding at the same time. I'm heterosexual. I'm a grandmother. So again, thinking about Thinking about people and changing the language to per person first, so it's it's not like she's crazy, she's schizophrenic. She's a woman on the streets who's suffering from schizophrenia, and also she's been exposed to HIV and now has tested HIV positive, right? So thinking about all the different ways people's in individual lives have intersectionality with all all kinds of in all kinds of ways of being in the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next slide, please. 
So here's what I want to bring home first, because it is fascinating to me. And it's, I think it's going to be, it's interesting in, as we think about how we respond to HIV uh, folks who have HIV, either in clinical settings or in community settings. So most often people will not reach out for any sort of mental health, behavioral health um, supports uh, because of the stigma of mental health and particularly in Indian country, right? If we just, we, we have that stigma that we might be crazy um, and we don't wanna be crazy. So we won't seek mental health services. So we begin to look for some of our trauma symptoms that feel like, uh, that are like PTSD, right? Sometimes we have bad dreams, we experience disassociation, we have body aches and joint aches, and we show up in clinical settings where, primary care settings where we're saying, you know, doc, I just, my head hurts, I ache all over, it feels like I'm dying, I either am, can't sleep at all or I sleep too much, what could it be? And so I, I, again, one of my other experiences, I worked in primary care settings a long time ago, and I can remember patients coming in with those vague complaints that why are you, you know, what, how, what, what do you need to be seen for today? And it was like, I just feel, and I've been feeling bad for a long time and I don't know what it is. And so we would run, you know, sinus series. If they talk, had any sinus symptoms, we do blood work, we do x-rays, everything. And mo a lo most of the time we couldn't find anything or we began to label them, right? As drug seekers, they were looking for painkillers. That's what they wanted. They wanted the uh, prescriptions because they were, they were misusing the prescriptions. And it, very often, I don't think any of that was true. I wish that then I knew what I know now, which is it was probably, they were probably trauma symptoms that went unrecognized by the caregivers, the professional primary care people, and of course the patients themselves. So we're, they're not aware that their current complaints are connected to past traumas, right? The other key piece in this is we can ask people, particularly as case managers, we have a different sort of role than, a, than maybe a, a, a physician does um, or a nurse practitioner, um, but we can, we can ask them about their trauma histories. And if we make a good connection, right, uh, with that individual, they're more than willing to talk about their trauma histories. So it's a good, so a good way of thinking about it in, in some clinical care settings, whether it's a, a community setting or a primary care setting, um, is that you have to, as we think about and talk about the impacts of trauma, we also have to be very cognizant that if everything is related to trauma, then nothing is related to trauma. We have to really be serious about thinking about how do we identify those individuals who really are struggling with their trauma histories, who really are experiencing depression and anxiety and PTSD um, symptoms and, uh, and those sorts of things that are impacting uh, their health and impacting how they engage in um, helpful relationships. Next slide, please. So again, uh, this is a huge piece of the conversation that, and this is what I call universal strategies. Um, trauma impacts the way people approach these helping, helping relationships. So if they have uh, histories of abuse, they can be really reluctant to engage or they drop out really easy. Um, they also uh, can use in uh, physical or co coercive practices that, um, where they've experienced that from the systems that they've reached out to help for. So I'm going to ask these quest this question, can you provide an example from your own professional experience where you, uh, you now that you know how, that trauma impacts behavior, that maybe some client, patient, student, relative's behavior might be associated with trauma because they engage in really unhelpful behaviors. Anyone have willing to share. We don't want to break confidences, of course. If you have an experience, you're welcome to share it in the chat. Um, I do have an experience working with um, young people. Um, you know, there's instances where things could, might mimic Maybe those um, environments might mimic some of the trauma that they've been through in the past. 
and they immediately kind of shut down and you don't really want to say anything. There's very little eye contact. Those are some of the things that I've experienced. Yes, yes, absolutely. There, you know, if um, like if somebody inadvertently, you know, they think they're giving a compliment even, even so even a, an adolescent or an adult where you're being kind to them, overly kind to them, it might be a trigger because if they're an adolescent, it may be that they uh, experienced grooming, right? Where this adult groomed them and treated them really well and bought them things. And now here you come along treating them really well and talking nice to them. And it can be a trigger. It's like, what do you want from me, right? So yeah, thinking about what those behaviors might mean. Exactly, thank you. And then again, the, it's the, the kinds of, uh, things that happen to us in school settings. I think of students in classrooms and that that administrator who slammed the kid up against the wall for behaviors. I mean, I can't imagine, I can't imagine that that didn't trigger that young man, right? And he ended up getting suspended. And I do believe that he was in danger of um, not graduating and got to the place where he didn't want to simply because he didn't want to enter the doors of that school again. So yes, very often. Uh, next slide, please. So again, thinking about the kinds of exams that people who have, uh, have uh, HIV might experience or might have experienced in those uh, clinical settings, right? Some, you know, pelvic exams can be very triggering for women who uh, have a, a history of sexual abuse or rape. Um, but it, and being in a, being um, in a uh, unfamiliar setting, right, like an exam room or a, or an office, um, it can really get people feeling vulnerable, and um, it can really trigger them. And it really is often sometimes a place where they've also been uh, experienced harsh treatment. Here's another story, personal story. My mother, a uh, brilliant woman. I took her to the clinic because I don't remember what the illness was. She came, so I waited for her. She came out to the car. She got in the car, sat and just was so angry. And she said to me, do I look stupid to you? And I said, well, of course not. What, what happened? She said, well, I went in and this doctor and he was telling me about the meds and how much and what to do and how to do this and that. And he said, and then he yelled at me, are you even listening to me? Do you even care? And she was like, well, yeah, but she wasn't using those Western European ways of, of responding, like nodding, oh, mm -hmm, making those approving sounds to that caregiver. And he wasn't used to it. And so again, so she was mistreated by the person that was supposed to be helping her. And those kinds of things happen all of the time in some care settings. Next slide, please. Here's, here's another thing. We don't know what we don't know. We really don't know until we ask. We don't know what their trauma histories are. We don't know, um, we don't know the communities, the families, their families of origin sometimes. And so when they sometimes present, and I think about this all the time, when I think about working in my clinic back on my reservation all those years ago, the wait time for patients was sometimes three and a half to four and a half hours, which is, and we were, we were trying to do our best to provide good care and move people in and out in a timely fashion and try not to treat them like cattle, but not realizing that all of those people out in the waiting room might be triggered by being ignored by us. Like I can remember not looking, walking out from the nurse's station to go to pharmacy and I would purposefully not look at the patients in the waiting room or to my, to my left, uh, the pharmacy was to my right because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know that all we had to do was go out and say, everybody's gonna be seen today. You know, we're, we're a couple providers down, there's a car wreck, there at the emergency room, you know, small towns. Um, and so, but you will be seen if you want, or, or you can make another appointment. It's uh, totally up to you, giving them some choices instead of just ignoring them and be, putting up a wall. So very often people that we're working with can present as irritable or hostile. And honestly, it has nothing to do with us. 
Um, we think about students always telling, I was telling people about students who come to school that come irritable and hostile already. We have no idea what that kid walked through before he got to your classroom, right? We have no idea what that person has walked through before they got to our offices or our exam rooms. We have no idea what the stressors were. We have no idea what the um, uh, events that occurred that morning were about. So we have to be very, we have to really depersonalize their hostile or irritable behavior. So, right, very often um, missed appointments for a multitude of reasons. Um, I think uh, I read one study where there is a brief intervention working with HIV patients and it was a 12 week, that they called that brief, it was a 12 week intervention and people got paid like 20 bucks and then they got 50 and then they got 60, but they were dropping out at all kinds of ways uh, all, all the time. And the average sort of stay in this was maybe six, six sessions. And it wasn't therapies. It was basically just having a conversation and developing strategies to help yourself feel better without using uh, IV drugs, if that's possible. Um, so, uh, but, and we also, we surveyed Indian Health Service uh, Billings area, which is Montana and Wyoming tribes, when we were thinking about trying to engage in a brief intervention therapeutic model with training all the mental health providers. And so we surveyed them and we asked how many sessions will your patients tolerate? Like, will they come, will they come an average of six sessions? four sessions and for the Billings area, which I don't think is much different than many other areas uh, uh, for tribes, um, they really average about two and a half sessions. So you have to think about what, what kind of sort of crisis management therapeutic models can we use in these situations because they're not gonna do the gold standard, not gonna do trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. They're in and out. So just know that, expect that they're going to miss appointments, right? And, or they, or they show up and they haven't been, they've missed the last two appointments and now they're showing up in crisis. I need this and I need it now. That is trauma-based behavior, okay? Um, they're not jerks. <laughs> they act like jerks, but they are not jerks. Um, they may be very reluctant to discuss some of their, some of the issues that are they're facing or they want, to, they want to discuss it right now and they want to be served right now. Another one is that confusion or poor memory. And that's another thing that I think uh, frontline people or case managers can experience a lot of. I remember while I was working there, I had one provider come out, it was diabetic clinic and he came out and it was a lovely elderly native woman. And uh, he came out and he said, I don't know how many times I have to tell her how many units she needs to use when her blood sugars get to such and such a level. I think I've told her every single time she's been in here for the last six weeks having, and she didn't have dementia, right? So not understanding that her, she may have had a trauma history and it was impacting her memory. And so making accommodations about uh, supporting people who have poor memories, um, obviously showing up with poor self-care. And again, that that sort of vague in pain a lot might not be look well I also worked with a client who um who who was using heroin and had been for a couple of decades and she talked to me about how it made her feel the very first time um and it was she said I felt safe I felt cocooned I felt nurtured those were her words and I knew her trauma history. So there's very often we do feel, they do feel these physical pains and sometimes the drugs are what actually finally brings relief. Next slide, please. So again, really, really thinking about this and really thinking about how, how are we gonna accommodate our clients now that we know what we know, right? Um, we really do have to understand that the problem behaviors uh, might be manifestations of their trauma. It might be coping skills. If you've always, if you, the way that you keep yourself safe is to get big and to get angry and to yell, you know, you're triggered in an exam room, you might, you might be engaged in that behavior because 
that's all you know to do to protect yourself. Um, it's those kinds of things. Or if it's just to shut down and get small and uh, disengage, that might be the behavior too. So uh, all kinds of things can trigger us, smells, sights, sounds, names, right? We have no idea what could be triggering that person. So they will, again, the, you will notice that they uh, miss a lot of appointments and they disengage in care. And uh, so we have to really put on those trauma lenses to help us understand our patients, our clients, our students, our relatives. And in order to sort of get to the place where we can create this therapeutic alliance and we can build, we can, we can help them uh, and yeah, it be, feel psychologically and physically safe in our presence. Next slide, please. So thinking about this though, I mean, it's so great that all of you are on here today. I'm, I just really appreciate you um, participating today, but really know that, you're, that you can't do it all, right? Trauma work is a team effort. There can't be just one provider or one case manager. It's gotta be a team effort. There's all kinds of reasons, but one of them is to take care of yourself. I think a big piece of why people get out of healthcare and get out of some of the sort of um, helping professions that are working with people who have experienced trauma is they start to burn out, they experience secondary traumatic stress or vicarious trauma. And it isn't just about hearing the stories like a lot of our people's like child welfare workers talk about hearing the children's stories. And that can be pretty traumatizing, right? But it really is daily having to engage with clients who have really challenging behaviors or relatives with challenging behaviors that are probably associated to their trauma histories, right? And that can lead to secondary traumatic stress. So you can't do it alone. Trauma knowledge is culture bound. We do have to think about not just in general historical trauma, but thinking about the community that we're working in. What are some of the local historical events that have occurred? For example, I always think of the community on Pine Ridge of Wounded Knee. Every single day, the, they go to work and go to school and go to the grocery store and go get gas, and they drive by that mass grave where their relatives' bones are, right? Where all of the those Lakota people, women, children, and old, elders were basically executed and dumped into a mass grave. So what is the local history too and how is it impacting communities and families? Um, so again, trauma work is really about building resilience, right? Um, it, and there are some strategies. So it's low cost, um, sometimes even low effort but it really is about building, trying to build people's resilience in, what, in whatever area that they feel most competent, right? Um, and again, I wish there was, here's how to become trauma-informed in three easy steps, but it just doesn't exist. It's multifaceted. It depends on your system. It depends on the population you're working with. It depends on your own education. It depends on the type of work that you're doing. So we really have to have a trauma lens. Um, through which we view the behavior, again, not, I should have said this also, not just of our clients, our patients, or our students, or our relatives, but our colleagues, right? Many of us come into these helping professions having our own trauma histories that might be unresolved if, we're, if we haven't been paying attention, right? If we haven't gone uh, and done some good work in doing our own healing. And so we can, we can engage in those kinds of behaviors too in the workplace. Next slide, please. So trauma-informed key assumptions, these, these are the four R's. What do you do about it? Yes, thank you, three and four. The, maybe, oh, there it is, okay. So first is to realize the widespread impact of trauma and understand the potential paths for recovery, building that resilience, um, meeting their basic needs, right? If I have, if I have experienced food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, living in a household or an environment that's not safe for me, not just physically, um, but emotionally, right? Um, 
So yeah, it, so just realizing it and then recognizing those signs and symptoms so we don't take it personally, so we don't think they're a bad person. I had a colleague um, who went to my, uh, to a, no, a tribal community with me and we met with the tribal leadership. And when we, when we got done, he said something about the tribal, this one particular tribal leader. And he said, man, he just really cares about kids. And I said, he does except he's got had six wives because he's so violent. And he said, well, he's a bad guy. And I said, no, he's not a bad guy. He's got a trauma history. And he said, well, and I said, no, look, if we continue to label people, we will, it, we will not leave room for change and hope and healing. So let's, let's really recognize the signs and symptoms of our relatives um, that are involved in our systems. And then and then let's respond in a way that integrates some basic knowledge about trauma. And we can do it like, do we have to say you missed two appointments and you can't make another appointment for six weeks, which we did in our clinic in like 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, is that really necessary? Can we do it a different way? Can we find different ways? What are the kinds of procedures and how are we going to introduce them to people who, may, who might have, have trauma histories? What, what kinds of practices will we engage in? How will we treat these people with kindness and respect and care, right? And then obviously really actively seek resisting re-traumatization. So you have to have that trauma lens, you have to know what it looks like, and then you have to know a way to respond because if you don't, you are guilty of re-traumatizing or triggering. I don't say re-traumatizing potentially, but you do are able, uh, may be triggering to uh, some clients or patients, students, relatives, or colleagues. Next slide, please. Oh gosh, oh gosh, sorry about this. Okay, so here's part of realizing Again, uh, look, making sure that your organization um, has got some training, um, looking at trauma that's not, don't just confine it to the behavioral health sector, right? It shows up in all sorts of places all of the time. And looking at what the barriers are to the effective outcomes for your patients or clients. Next slide, please. I was really getting into it. Um, American Indians are facing current traumas. So we have to historically, interpersonally, and then community-wide. And that's what we have to always be aware of as we provide services is that there's, we have to be expected to address past, present, and our own in, uh, vicarious trauma or secondary traumatic stress, how it impacts us as care, professional caregivers. Next slide, please. Again, really understanding and uh, understanding how to recognize, getting the training for everyone uh, so that they can recognize using trauma screens and assessments to help in that. Um, so just again, looking at and understanding what those behaviors mean. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, looking at some of your policies and procedures and how do you create safety for your clients? Um, and again, really thinking about not just the physical safety, but how do you create that psychological safety? I feel safe here. I don't feel threatened by you know, the provider. I don't feel threatened by the procedures. I don't feel threatened by the language being used. Um, really uh, consistently using communication to try to connect with and support uh, individuals and families. Next slide, please. The, here's some uh, information on how to resist re-traumatization. Again, looking at uh, your organization's um, policies and procedures. How do you really infuse local cult, tribal culture beliefs about resilience and recovery and healing into the work that you do? Um, and look, thinking about those universal precautions that uh, so that everyone expects the presence that people have trauma in their lives and respond accordingly. Next slide, please. How do you enhance resilience? Next slide. So we always say that the best evidence-based treatment for trauma is relationships. Relationship, relationship, relationship. Promoting caring, peer relationships among your clients, um, helpful family members getting engaged in the, in the work, um, thinking about who, 
helping them understand who the secure base figures are within your own organization. You know, there's always a couple of people that are always thought of as that auntie or that person that they anyone can go to to talk about anything. Um, and how are you going to support while they're in the middle of a crisis? What's that going to look like for you? What are the steps that are trauma informed, and what are the approaches that you're going to use? Really teaching self-regulation, this is huge. You know, I, I sort of poo-pooed the breathing exercises until I found out there's one breathing exercise that um, the military trains in, in prepping combat um, soldiers before they go into battle. And so, it because it really does regulate their cortisol levels, it regulates their adrenaline, it regulates all kinds of things. So it really will help them in relaxing and, and becoming aware of their, of, and being present. Um, and really thinking about how can we have meaningful engagement, not just a suggestion box, right? How, what kind of meaningful engagement are your clients looking for? And then obviously support the cultural traditions of those individuals, adapt the tools or even the screeners that you use that uh, connect with that person and uh, encourage a co pro co pro-social peer engagement. Next slide, please. So are we wearing our trauma goggles? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Next slide. How will we know? So that's something to think about after this presentation. But I wanna end with the key messages of trauma-informed care. And that is, it's the person's experience of the event, not the event itself, that's traumatizing. Remember that we're all individuals, we all have different responses. Next slide, please. Key message number two, again, the adaptations, uh, the emo behavioral and ad emotional adaptations that uh, maltreated children and adults make uh, in order to survive are brilliant creative solutions, but they can be personally costly. So they're ending up in your care uh, as case managers because they engage in some survival strategies that now place them in their health in danger. Next slide, please. And again, if you don't look for acknowledged trauma in the lives of children and adolescents and adults, we end up chasing their behaviors. We end up trying to sanction uh, moms in child welfare. We end up suspending students. We end up um, pushing people out of care. Um, so but that's the, another key message of trauma. And the next slide, please. So here's the conclusion, and then we can have an answering question. I apologize that I, oh gosh. Uh, any comments or questions that we can end with? <clears throat> well, thank you, Marilyn, for that presentation. And it's fine if we go over just a little, if everyone wants to stay in chat. So feel free to ask more questions or any questions, everyone. Um, I do have a question for you. And thank you for your presentation. It was a lot to digest, at least yeah. for me. Um, <laughs> But hopefully some of our um, viewers will be able to take some of that information and incorporate it into their own services that they provide at their agency. But one of the questions that I have for you is what advice could you give to our non-Native relatives who work in our communities to learn about the traumas of the community, the histories, um, you know, so they are well informed about the communities that are that they are sharing. So or that they are serving. So if you could give any advice for our non-native relatives or yeah, even yeah. some of our relatives that aren't tribal to their communities that they're serving as well. Right, right. I think it's so difficult. I get, I'm thinking of uh, a, that, uh, I hate to burden us as native people, but we are really the ones who have to be the ones that are willing to teach, to educate, to support. So if we have a non, uh, if we have a, a European American that's come to provide services to our people, whether we're in an urban setting or not, or for instance, I go into a Southwest, I go into Diné country and I have no idea what the social norms and expectations are in, in histories, right? I'm a Northern Plains tribe person. So it's really uh, up to us to say, let, let, let us, as part of your onboarding, or now that you're here as part of you know, professional development, we're going to provide you a presentation on historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, and the impacts of it and what you can, and so some of the reasons why we continue to struggle with things like 
you know, poverty, unemployment, um, domestic violence, that sort of thing. It, um, unfortunately, we, ha we have to be the Sherpas, right? We have to be the ones that guide the tribal people who are not tribal members in that understanding. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and then also I am um, wondering what, what information would you suggest for those who aren't too familiar about the symptoms of people who may be trauma, um, you know, that may have trauma? Um, I think that'd be a right. So uh, if you have access to the internet, and I hope you do, <laughs> if you just try type in uh, trauma informed approaches or trauma informed care, there will be an explosion of websites. 15 years ago, there wasn't, there was probably three or four. We are part, part of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, and so if I'll type it in the chat, www.nctsn.org. This is a national organization that really looks at uh, PTSD in children and adolescents. And there's a whole bunch of free fact sheets, handouts um, that, that you can read that really, um, if you can think about it for across the lifespan, um, really can be helpful. And then go to our website, which is uh, www.nationalnativechildrenstraumacenter.org, nnctc.org. Yes, or contact me, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so thank you, Dr. Zimmerman, for that presentation and for the resources that you also did provide for us. We're very um, happy to be able to do that. Um, also for our participants, Kurt has put in the chat the evaluation link. So we would appreciate if you could uh, fill out that evaluation link for us. Um, and again, I want to thank you, Dr. Zimmerman, for being able to uh, be with us and present to us on this important topic uh, so we can begin to implement those in the services that we're providing for our own clients. You know, I know it was a lot to digest, but we are here <laughs> as well as a resource, right? Right. So yes. Okay. Thank you all. Thank I'm very humbled by the invitation. Thank you for inviting me to this. You have a great day. Welcome. You too. Thank you very much. Uh, any uh, last words, Savannah? Let me put my email. Yes, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Zimmerman. I really appreciate it. And for everyone who joined us today, um, continue to reach out to us if you have any questions. We will post this on the YouTube page, as we've mentioned in the chat. Um, and Yes, please um, join our Facebook page, NNHN, um, our Instagram as well. And then keep, on, keep a lookout for materials coming out for National Native HIV Awareness Day, which happens on March 20th um, or around the spring equinox every year. So thank you all. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye.